OK, uh, so this lecture is going to pick up pretty much exactly where we left off last week. But before we do, let's just sort of throw one of the some of the hundreds of definitions that we had last week. So just to recall, we're looking at functions f from omega n, which is always going to be negative 1, 1 to n. Well, not always, most of the time, to the real numbers. And I'm going to call the space space of function, such functions is L2 of omega. Again, L2 not being any restriction, it's a finite space. We have their Fourier basis um, and a Fourier transform on them. And I guess, so they're not. Basis with quiet just being the parity on the set i, on the set s, excuse me. And f hat of s is just the inner product of f and chi s, with the inner product being defined in the exact way you expect. The product of the functions is taking their integral and averaging, or alternatively, the expectation of the product, where x is considered as a uniform random variable in omega. So, so sort of two quantities we're going to be very interested in today, same time as last, same thing as last week, influences and noise sensitivity. So influence of the IF coordinate in F is the probability that changing the IF coordinate changes the value of F. And we showed last week. that we can get the influence by summing the squares of the Fourier coefficients over all sets that include i, or alternatively, by taking the expectation of the square of the discrete derivatives. This, of course, only works for Boolean functions. Uh, Boolean, just in case to remind you, the range has to be plus or minus 1. So if it's Boolean, we have this discrete derivative, where the discrete derivative is exactly what you think it is. Take set x to 1 on the ith coordinate and keep it the same, and then subtract the value at minus 1 at the, at the appropriate thing and divide by 2. We divide by 2 such that dif is going to take on values of plus or minus 1 or 0 in the case that f is Boolean. Also, if f is monotone, we also saw that the influence influence at i of f is just given by the Fourier coefficient of the singleton set. So that sort of tells us what those, the, the, 40, the first Fourier level is. It simply influences, at least for monotone functions. OK. We also have the spectral sample, which is our very important random kind of variable. That's f. A random variable <coughs> such that we we'll simply give the weight of a set by the Fourier coefficient squared. And thanks to the Plancherel theorem, we know that, or I guess Parseval in this case, we know that uh, if f is Boolean, this is perfectly well normalized because the L2 normal of Boolean function is 1. It's either 1 or plus 1. Not that exciting. So in the definition, we found that influence of i, the total influence, you can think of this as an L1 norm. If we just consider the vector of all the, of the, all the influences, this is exactly equal to the expected side of the spectral sample. This is just, I'm just throwing a bunch of the formulas we had last time on the board. And using this, we also used, we also proved Poincaré in discrete space, that is, the influence is bounded by the variance from below. 
Okay, the other sort of important thing we talk except influences is noise operators. What the noise operator does, if I give you row, a number between zero and one, I'm going to take a function and take a point at that function and I'm going to noise it up by row bit by bit. That is, with probability row, I'm going to keep it exactly the same. And with probability one minus row, I'm going to randomize it. That is, make it equal, equally likely to be plus one or minus one. Then I'm going to take an expectation over all these things at, uh, by evaluating f at that point. So, this is t row of f of x is defined as the expectation of f of n row of x, where n row is, p correla is row correlated to x. Row equals 1, get x. Row equals 0, get a completely independent random variable. And this is a function. And the reason we're sort of working in Fourier space in many ways is that t row f of x has a very simple Fourier expansion. All we do is just multiply the Fourier coefficient with rho s by rho to the power of the size of the set. Just to make sure, so um, n rule of x is not uh, equal to x with probability 1 minus rho not equal to x with probability. No, not quite. Uh, it's, if you really want to write out what the, the marginals of that, because uh, if you get 1 minus rho, you have a half probability of being x and a half probability of minus x. So you have to add uh, 1 half 1 minus rho and 1 half 1 minus rho. The reason we define it this way is to help the intuition. If we randomize a bit, it's going to be completely independent. Because if I put it rho and 1 minus rho, the actual probability of, you know, of changing is double that. So this is sort of the, the more convenient normalization. Just gives us this formula more nicely, and this is basically where we're going with this. And as you can see, even with very, very small noise, the noise operator is going to regularize the function in the sense that very large Fourier norms are going to become much, much smaller. Notice, by the way, that even if f is a Boolean function, t rho is in general not a Boolean function. It's going to take on a lot of values in between. Well, between negative 1 and 1, you can sort of see that from here. But it's definitely not Boolean. But it does sort of have some of these nice properties. And we're going to, in probably 10 or 15 minutes, explain exactly what that regularization means in very, very concrete terms. But if you like to sort of keep it in the back of your head, just remember, in normal Fourier analysis, Fourier, Fourier transforms and heat kernels are going to play very nicely with one another. Here, this is going to allow us to get control of far larger, if you like to think, moments of a function given very little information where the cost will be these kind of uh, noise operators and the fact that we're not exactly sure what the function is, we're sort of fuzzing it out over the having cube. Okay. One last thing is something that I actually made, made a bit a small mistake last week, so I'm let me correct that. I'm going to try the noise stability at n and epsilon of a function f. It's not exactly a standard definition, but last time, this is essentially the idea of if I take a function, take a very, very small perturbation of it, how well is it correlated? Now, last time I did it for the case of mean zero functions, that is, an empty for, the empty Fourier coefficient was zero. Let me correct that and give you the general form. So I'm going to take the function and its correlation with its 1 minus epsilon noise, subtract the mean squared, and divide by the variance. So you can see that if epsilon is equal to 0, this is just the L2 norm. So what we get is just the variance, 1 over variance, and we get exactly 0. If these two, <coughs> excuse me, if these two completely decouple, I'm not getting 0 anymore because I'm just getting sample f, then sample f completely independently. 
So what I'm getting is the mean squared. So this completely zeroes out, and once again, we get one. So this is just the correct normalization. And I guess I'll do it over here. It's sensitive if this goes to one, that is the asymptotic theory couple, when we take the limit first in n and then in epsilon, that's an up to infinity. Noise stable. <sighs> okay, I think I just did it in what? 10 minutes, the entirety of last week's lecture. OK. So let's start proving things. So the first thing I'm going to prove is the famous KKL theorem, Kahn, Kalai, and Lineal. Let me just state it for the umpteenth time, just to be safe. So delta is essentially the L infinity norm of that same influence vector I have. I look at the maximal influence. And for any Boolean function, I can find that the maximal influence is not only bound by the variance, like Poincaré, but we also actually get an extra factor, which depends, like, which grows like 1 over the log, log of 1 over, excuse me, uh, that L infinity norm. So this can be thought of as an, this is a vast improvement over Poincaré, especially when the maximal influence is bounded. And this is exactly where sharp thresholds come from. So all we need to show to show the existence of a sharp threshold is an L infinity bound, which is non-trivial, actually goes to zero. Let's prove this. So the first thing we do is Let's see what exactly is it about the influence I need to bound. So we're going to play some quick formal tricks. As we said, the influence is equal to that spectral sample size. And if I fix m, for any fixed m, I can sort of write a reverse Markov inequality. Right? This is bounded below by m. times the probability. That SF is larger than them. Divide by M and you get the Markov inequality. And now if I look at the probability that SF is larger than M, if I now add the, the probability that's between 1 and M, I'm going to get exactly the variance, right? So sum of the Fourier coefficient squared minus the zeroth. So what I have here is the variance. Right? So what we end up having here is that in order to control this maximum influence, what we need to do is to control the spectral sample below an M, where M is still up to my control. But what I want to sort of see is see how well does the sample concentrate around its low modes, 1 through m. And of course, what we'd really like to do is get a control of that in terms of delta and possibly the maximal influence. Okay? So the game is all about these low spectral norms.
So this is going to be a recurring theme today. So we must Okay, now let me just make sure I'm writing this correctly. Also notice we can start at zero, and that's generally very good. You don't want to just ever include the zero sample because you're never going to get control of it. The zero sample only gives you the mean of f, and since this is sufficiently general that f might have a mean, you really don't want to show that that's small, which is good, which is why I put the variance here and not just one. You, so that, that's the part that make, mean, makes variance the important thing, not just the total L2 norm. If I multiply in S, I'm not doing anything. I'm just making things larger, right? And let's just write this out definitionally. Right, this is just the definition of the spectral sample. And I now restrict this. So what I want to do now is I want to take advantage of that thing we spoke earlier. We, I want to noise this up. I want to pay a certain cost. Maybe, obviously, it's going to depend on how much noise I put in. And I want to make this into a noise operator of something that is nice. And the way I do that, I'm going to multiply by 2 to the 2n. and divide by 1 half to the 2 to 2 to the size of s. And because I have a cutoff on the side of s, I know that this is not bigger than that. And obviously, I'm including some smaller terms. No big deal. Right? And for just to erase that inclusion, again, I'm just adding more squares, add, making things bigger. So this is where I'm going to use that cutoff. So I pay an exponential price in m in order to introduce a noise, a set-sensitive noise that sort of takes whatever set and buzzes it up by one half. So one half of the coordinates are going to change. That's what you're going to see to say, I take whatever set the function lives in and spread it out at least by changing half of the coordinates and using that noise operator, that heat kernel. And at some point, I hope that this is going to give me something. Now. I'd like this to be the L2 norm of something, which is why I put the twos here. And you can sort of see everything squared. So there seems like a good reason to be an L2 norm. And you can do that. By just instead of summing the number of coordinates, I sum up over the coordinates and over i being in that coordinate, and we get exactly that same equality. This is just algebra. And now here, I have something that's very nice, because if I look at this guy, I'm fixing i, summing over all sets, including, in, uh, including that i, and add, uh, have a noise operator of that. So that's just the L2 norm of the noise operator applied to the discrete derivative using the formulas that we proved last week. Right? If we look, take a discrete derivatives, the Fourier coefficients stay the same, but they only now live on sets, excuse me, on sets that include i. So remembering this where it's only on sets, on sets including s, this, what we end up getting is a 
I have a 2 to the 2n. I've got summing over all the possible coordinates because I'm doing some of that. And I'm taking the one half noise of the derivative in the i, the discrete derivative in the i direction, and taking the L2 norm. Formal manipulations at this point, nothing very exciting, but it's important that I paid an exponential price to gain this fuzzing operator. At this point, a miracle occurs. What we sort of know is that this is going to punish my very large Fourier norms. The way that we're going to formalize this is just something that's going to come completely out of nowhere, and I will come back in a second, and it's going to look like a completely technical condition. But it's the following inequality, which we will speak about at length in a second. Um, I believe this is one of those stories. I, it's very unclear who exactly proved this theorem first. Uh, I believe that the first person is Aline Bonamy out of Lyon, who proceeded to write this in her, in her uh, PhD thesis that no one knew about because it was written in French. <coughs> and like 10 or 15 years, I'm not 100% certain, but a lot later people realized, wait, this has been around for a while. Why did we not know this? So I'm just not going to stick with names because so there's like five different names associated with this. I'm going to call it the hypercontractive inequality. If I take a row noise of f and take its L2 norm, that is bounded by the 1 plus row squared norm of f. It is contractive because this gives me an operator which is a contract contraction because there's no constant in front. And it's hyper contractive because not only am I getting a, a control of the norm, I'm getting control in a better norm. Because remember, rows in 0, 1. So I'm somehow controlling the L2 norm of a guy by, a, let's say, rows equal 1 half, like it is for her, the 5 fourths norm. This is insane. This is a very, very powerful thing. Because if for general random variables, of course, we definitely can't control the variance by a lower moment. right? But something about these noise operators, something about the way that they interact with the Hamming cube. But for now, let's just consider this as a tool. We just have an uh, inequality here. So, what I get I get rid of my nose operator, rho is equal to 1 half, so I have a 5 fourths norm. And the quantity is now squared. Now, <coughs> let me make sure I'm not making any mistakes here. Where is my second page? Oh, it's right there. Just wanted to make sure I'm being careful here. We're taking the 5 fourths norm, so I get the absolute value of DIF to the 5 fourths to the 4 fifths, but we have a square on the side, so we have an 8 fifths. So the fact that this number is larger than 1 is essential. Now comes the fun. F is a Boolean function, right? So DIF takes on three values, which are 1, 0, and minus 1. If I take the absolute value of that, and I take it to the 5 fourth power. Who cares? Right? I'm just getting zeros and ones here. 
because it's because f is, since f is boolean, f is boolean. I'm just going to put a square there because we know that the square for general functions, I can if I if I consider a monotone function, I can consider the first power, absolute value, whatever you want. But the square is always a nice one because for any function that's Boolean, we know that's exactly the influence, the, the expected value of dif squared. So five fourths square, no difference. This is just exactly the influence in the ith direction. Now we're getting somewhere, right? I've got the spectral sample contro controlled in terms of something which looks like my influences to a weird power, but still the influences. So what am I going to do now? Well, I'd like to get just the L1 norm. And I have, and I'm going to want to do this in terms of the L infinity norm. If you really want to think about it, you can say I'm using holder in the one infinity case. But really, I'm just pulling out a maximum to the 3 fifths. So what I have is that the probability of being at most at, uh, between 1 and m in the spectral sample is now controlled by my L infinity norm, my L1 norm, and some constant that depends on m. So basically all that's left is algebra now. the star. So substituting into star. I get that the total influence times this factor, which depends on delta and m. 1 over m plus 2 to the 2 to the m delta to the 3 fifths is bounded up below by the variance. All we have to do now is play optimization games, because m is totally under my control, as long as it's a positive integer. Well, strictly larger than 1. So you can sort of see, what's, you can sort of see logs popping up here, right? I'd like these two to be equal, and I'd like them to somehow balance out correctly. And just to spare you guys the work, I make this a one over delta, so it's positive. I'm going to make m be 3 tenths log 2 of 1 over delta minus 1 half log 2 of log 2 of 1 over delta, because of course. I'm just, I did some algebra here and, and optimized this over my choice of m. This first term here means that this term is going to completely cancel out. And I'm going to be left with 2 to the power of log log. And that just gives me a 1, uh, uh, one the, just log 2 of 1 over delta. And over here, I'm going to get. 1 over m times some power of this. Now, there is an issue if delta is very large, right? So if delta is, let's say, like almost 1, we might have a bit of an issue here, right? So now we have to sort of do some silly cases. So if delta is smaller than, let's say, 1 over 100, then m is going to be bounded below by, I don't know, 1 over 10. So the subtracting term is not that important. I picked 1 over 100 almost arbitrarily. I just needed some constant. It's 11. Okay. 
and just substituting everything in, I get this kind of, like the 11 is pretty arbitrary. I just picked a constant to make it work. If delta is large, well then let's look at the inequality I'm trying to prove. I've got a constant here, a constant here, and the variance. Poincaré is going to do. Right, I already know that the influence is bounded by the variance. I just pick C large enough to cancel whatever it is I'm getting here. Pick C to be, what do I need to be? I need to get all, that to be one. So pick C And that completes the proof. Probably should have done the easy, easy case first, just forgot to. Log 100 will do. Well, you want it to be small, right? Because I want this product to be, right? So one over log 100 is. Thanks. <laughs> Not important. The point is there's a constant, right? So there's sort of, we did sort of give you a magic input from the outside, right? I gave you uh, the hypercontractive inequality, which sort of did a lot of the work. But what it does is that it takes this very complicated function of the discrete derivative in general. And at the cost of an, at an exponential cost, and again, the fact that everything requires exponential in the size of the set is the reason why logs show up in all of these inequalities, right? That's why we have a log right here. At that cost, in the noise operator, I somehow managed to kill all the large dependents and sort of get back to the influence, which is very uh, sort of level one dependence. Because the influences are very much dependent on the first Fourier coefficients. So what this does, and this is, very, very, very magical to me. We take a dependence on the spectral sample all the way up to logarithmic size, and we somehow smear it all back in to just one Fourier level, the first Fourier level. And this, this is sort of the magic that, that's allowed to, that the hypercontractive inequality lets us do. And it gives us this extra logarithmic term, which we know is tight, remember, tribes. We know we can't even try to do better, because we'll always have a function that actually realizes inequality up to a constant. So this is really optimal in that sense. Okay? Good one. So let's talk about hypercontractivity for a second. So there's sort of a probabilistic and a geometric interpretation of this. Let me try to give you both. sometimes called the small sets or expander theorem. And it says the following thing. Let negative one, one, and N be, A, N be a set, subset of the n-dimensional Hamming cube. Whose size is very small. It's going to be little over one. I'm going to call that alpha N. Then if I look at the indicators of the, the sequence of indicators of the set, this will be a noise sensitive sequence. Make sure I do this right. Not, it's not a very difficult proof, but let's just make sure. So in order to look at noise sensitivity, I'm always gonna have to look at how a function relates to its to its slight noising, right? So what I need to look at is 
is this guy, right? So that's equal to, I can think of this by just expanding it. I'm going to take the Fourier coefficient of these guys, multiply it by rho to the size of the set. But there's this nice thing where T rho is somehow a self-dual operator because all I'm taking is, not quite, but all I'm taking is, well, it is self-dual, but not, not quite I'm going to use. I'm taking rho to a power of a set. So if I want to sort of move over a square root of rho to the right-hand side, if I take a square root of rho noising here and a square root of rho, of rho noising here, I get the same thing, right? I'm just going to get square root of root to the size of s times square root of root to the size of s. And when I put them together, I just get the exact same thing in Fourier norm. So all of that is just to say And this is just an algebraic identity. And this should not be f. This should be the indicator of an. Right? And then by the hypercontractive inequality, I get this. And again, this is not a Boolean function, but it is a 0 to 1 function. So all I'm getting is just when I take the 1 over rho and the rho, I'm just getting the same thing again. And this is just equal. To a strictly larger than 1 power of alpha n. So the way this sort of works, if you think of it geometrically, is if I pick a point in x, and then I'm going to take a row probability of changing each coordinate. Even if I started tautologically with probability 1 in x, I'm going to have a very, very small probability of remaining in x after I do this slight noise. So what does that tell us? It tells us we have a huge boundary. That is, small sets, even if I change, let's say, if I set rho to 1 third, for example. That is, if I keep 2 thirds of the coordinates exactly the same and change only 1 third with probability 1 half, so I don't even change 1 third of them, right? I change a strictly larger, strictly lower proportion. The probability that I still remain in the set, regardless of the, si of the shape of that set, becomes small. Because remember, this is a small number. If you'd like to sort of think of this as a, to, to get a bit of a better intuition, imagine this to be exponential. So think of this as, let's say, like 3 fourths to the n. So if I now set rho to be 1 third, for example, what I'm sitting here, is that the probability if I start at the set and then change a one-third coordinate, I now have a strictly, it's going to be a worse. It's going to be three-fourths to, let's say, one-third. So, make sure I don't do this. I didn't do this in my head. Uh, One-half, I think, yeah. So we get uh, square root of three over two to the power of n, the probability of remaining that set. That's still exponential. That is, if you start an exponentially small set, the boundary, if you will, makes up all but an exponential fraction of the, total of the total edges that you have in the geometry given by this slightly weird noise operator. So this is very clear if we start with a set that's really disconnected, like let's say a parity set that takes this point and then only points that are dis disjointed in terms of the Hamming cube, that is, like that orange set we took last time. But this holds completely generally. So that's why I like to think of it as an isoparametric theorem. It tells you that even if, as long as you have a small set in the Hamming cube, you will always have very, very large boundaries. As long, and the size of that boundary is always going to be a better power. That is, if this is exponential, I get a better exponential. OK, but that's not the theorem we want. I think that's a, it's really important. That's the way I like to keep it in the back of my head, because a lot of this gets very, very technical. And you're like, what the hell does, is this? 1 plus rho squared, 2 rho. We're just looking at how easy it is to exit a set. And it turns out that at least if the set is small, very, very easy. OK, so now let's look at the noise sensitivity at n of epsilon. Recall that that's 1 minus the variance of an indicator is just its probability minus its probability squared. And then I need to take this at 1 minus epsilon. You will note that this is strictly, <coughs> 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 
excuse me, strictly larger than one. So that if I subtract the epsilon alpha n and take the limit as n goes to infinity first, I'm getting zero for any fixed epsilon. So this goes to zero and this entire thing goes to one. So for any fixed epsilon, taking the limit in n first larger than 1, of course. So what we're seeing here is that really the fact that this, this set is small and the size of that set is sort of telling you how noise sensitive you are. Just a bit if the set's not particularly small, but the smaller the set, the more noise sensitive you are. Two questions. Yes. This theorem uh, translates to generic sequence of Boolean functions considering the, the, the characteristic sets where the function is plus one? Yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> if I just consider a n to be the set at which this is the set of one, of course it is. That's generally not an easy way to, to specify a function. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you're plus one, and this is why I was, very, I was careful to make sure that I fixed uh, Hannah, you weren't here in the beginning, but the, you, you caught an important mistake last week where uh, I it only stated noise sensitivity for the expected value being zero. So the formula is somewhere you can look at a notes to fix it for sets of uh, non-vanishing non uh, mean. Because if I consider this to be a Boolean function, plus or minus one, these sets are going to be very, very biased. By definition, they're small. They're mostly plus one, not minus one. Right? So this is sort of tells you that biased functions are noise sensitive. Unbiased functions, which are usually far more interesting, not necessarily noise sensitive. And the question of what happens there is the really interesting question. But yes, absolutely. If you'd like to think of it that way, that's completely equivalent. Biased functions are expanders, noise sensitive. Any other questions? OK, what I'm going to do now and I'm sort of going to apologize ahead of time because this is technical and unpleasant, but I sort of want to show my cards. I'm going to prove Bonomi Bechner for n equals 1. So the hypercontractive inequality for n equals 1. The question of, that seems sort of silly, right? It's a function from negative 1, 1 to r has this property. The question of, I mean, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to prove this because it's hyper technical and really, really a digression for what we're dealing with. It turns out that if you prove it for n equals 1, there is sort of an induction argument uh, best based on tensor products and all that kind of stuff to show that if you have it for any function of one dimension, you can build up larger functions by just t taking the tensor product of the, the product of the functions and tensor products of the noise operators, which are just larger noise operators. If you don't know what any of those words mean, do not worry. Uh, it's just a matter of sort of building up to larger dimensions by looking at the projections at the smaller dimensions. And there is some very nice functional analytic backward, uh, background to this that I'm not going to bother with. So I hope you guys trust me, and you'll see how technical and awful this proof is. So you'll see why I don't want to go on. But it turns out that it's sufficient to prove this inequality. So it is sufficient. to prove so specifically if it's for negative one to one to r I want not particularly exciting. And this is for all okay. It's a function of two bits. You can always write it as a plus bx. Not that exciting. And therefore, this is true. 
We only have one operator to, to noise. So the claim is now Let me make sure I get these powers correct because I'm going to embarrass myself otherwise. So we need to prove this inequality for a squared real number, b squared real number, a, a real number, b real number, and rho between 0 and 1. So if a is 0, that's obvious, right? So we can assume that a is non-zero. And in fact, we can then divide through, just divide through by a to the power of 1 plus rho squared. And this translates to. There's an equality. Not that exciting, I know. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell or expand the right side. And that's actually not that difficult because these are, gen these are generalized binomials. Right? So the right hand side. And this is if y is in 0, 1. Because I need to make sure this actually you know, converges. But all I'm doing is just using the generalized binomial theorem. Is if 1 plus rho squared is not an integer, this is just going to be an infinite series. Notice that these match up perfectly, canceling out the odd terms. Which is, let's just see if we get this right. So that's one. Just writing out the first two terms. Now, we still have this condition to make sure that this actually makes sense. But given that condition, Turns out if I subtract its first two Taylor coefficients, so that's 1, and then the next term is y squared rho squared 1 plus rho squared minus 2. It turns out that if I just compute, take this function, take its derivative, I'm going to get a negative number. And it's 0 at 0, so this is negative. I did tell you this is going to be a horrible proof. <laughs> I'm not hiding. This is a very, very technical step-by-step -step thing. It turns out that this is negative, And all the next terms are going to be positive. So what we get here, this is exactly the left-hand side minus the first two terms of the right-hand side is a negative number. And that gives us the case. Gives us the case. In fact, we can push it all the way to 1 by continuity. Not exciting, I know. If it's larger, I'm just going to look at its opposite. And writing in terms of z, of z, the claim
Right hand side remains the same. I get a z squared plus rho squared instead of 1 plus y squared rho squared at this time. Now, turns out. But this is actually smaller than the first one in this case. And if you want to see that, why that is, just take that to the right-hand side. And this is equivalent to 0 is smaller than by just expansion. Positive number, positive number. I didn't honestly expect you to follow this. This is just a bunch of technical computation. All I, the reason I put it on the board, honestly, is to try to sort of show my cards. Although this is, has a very large number of ramifications, this is not a deep theorem. <laughs> this is a technical theorem that allows you to bound one norm into the other. And modulo the fact that I'm asking you to trust me that n equals 1 is sufficient. I've just proven everything we needed from step 1 to, to the KKL theorem. So I still think, honestly, and I've seen this proof many, many times, I still feel this has the touch of black magic. Because it seems like you're not really doing anything and you're getting a lot out of it. Because you're getting a control of the L1 norm in terms of the L infinity norm with this extra log. And in fact, if you, I didn't prove this to you, but this should be a very simple exercise. You can get, assume first KKL, assume second KKL, which is the one we proved. I being bounded in terms of the L infinity norm. You can also just bound the L infinity norm in terms of log n over n times the variance, of course, which I generally is called the first KKL theorem, or at least I've heard it called that. So you can show that, 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 one, that the second one implies the first one very, very simply. You can just write down a few lines, and I guess you probably should. So all of this influence stuff comes very much from just the very non-trivial way that Boolean functions and their spectrums interact. You really don't have to look at the entire thing up to log n. You can really look at the first level. OK, I guess this is a good time for a break. OK, so let's continue. Uh, yeah, so Ryan and Dallin's book, just uh, if you want a good reference, uh, chapter 9 is all about hyperconductivity. It goes on in much, 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 much greater detail, proves everything properly. Um, it's a bit technical, I'm not going to lie, and it's chapter 9 of a book, so obviously it's going to refer back to a lot of things. But it's, I think, the best treatment I've seen in terms of getting everything that you can possibly get out of that little inequality. So um, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to prove a version of the BKS noise sensitivity theorem. So, Benjamin Nikolai and Schramm, uh, 98, I believe. Uh, I'm going to give you the, the version I'm going to prove, not the version that uh, they proved, which is slightly stronger, which is. Considering a Boolean function, a sequence of Boolean function fn, we don't know how many bits it depend on. This could be an arbitrary function of mn as long as it goes to infinity. And I define h of fn to be the L2 norm of, that vec of the influence vector. So the sums of squares squared. I guess it's technically not quite the L2 norm without the square root. But If I, get a, if I get a polynomial bound, mn minus delta, for some fixed delta, then this, no, this function is noise sensitive. As I mentioned, this is weaker. It actually turns out that we just need hfn to vanish. Uh, but in the case where it's vanishing slower than polynomial, or yeah, I think that's, that's the edge case for the proof I'm going to present. 
you need to work harder and you need to use some really magical version of, uh, I guess it's technically just a stronger version of hypercontractivity that uh, Talagrand wrote in terms of exponentials as opposed to uh, polynomial terms. Anyway, it's provable, we're not going to do it. We're just going to look at this case, which will be sufficient for everything we're interested in. The proof is going to be remarkably similar to KKL. So as we know, we talked about this last week, if you want to actually <coughs> control noise sensitivity, you want to show that no fixed interval contains any mass in this, of the spectral sample as n goes to infinity. So I'm going to look at the probability I'm going to fix an m to be determined, and I want to see the probability that it's be between 1 and m times log of mn. Now, using the exact same procedure I got before, So making the exact same thing, the exact same procedure, I'm going to consider the, spectral, the expectation of the spectral sample, bound the, uh, write the sum, multiply in a nose operator, divide by the nose operator at the cutoff, and the, get rid of the cutoff, sum up in terms of L2 norms of noise operators of the discrete derivatives. Completely the same, and again, I'm going to apply hypercontractivity. and the fact that it's Boolean, except this time I don't get a eighth fifth powers, I get a power that depends on rho. So what power do I get here? I get two to the one plus rho squared. Right, exactly the same, this is hypercontractivity. So last time we used the fact that we got a power strictly larger than one here, because we were interested in getting an L1 norm. This time, we'd like to get control of the L2 norm. So the obvious thing to do is to use Holder's inequality. With the harmonic pair, let's see what we need. I'd like to get the L2 norm, so I'd like to take this to the 1 plus rho squared power. And its pair is going to be, I believe, 1 plus rho squared over rho squared. The inverses are, are sum up to 1. So of course, I have the function 1 over here. I take 1 to a power and sum it up. I'm just going to get mn to a certain power. So So I get mn terms, each one of them to that power. And I get from this, if I take it to the power of 1 plus rho, I get exactly the L2 norm power. Now you can see why I wanted a polynomial bound, right? Because this is going to be a large polynomial. This is going to be a large polynomial. But now I get an extra, one minus, uh, an extra minus delta. So by assumption, what I have here is mn to what power? Capital M times log of 1 over O squared plus
right? So I've got mn to a very, very big, nasty thing. But luckily, I've got two parameters that are totally under my control. Delta is given to me, but if it's positive, I can come up with a row that's sufficiently small so that this entire thing is not a big deal. It's a negative number. And then this now becomes very large, but I control m, so I pick m sufficiently small such that this entire thing is negative. So by judiciously picking rho positive m positive, the exponent becomes negative. So what that tells us is that as n goes to infinity, the probability of the spectral sample being between 1 and log mn times a very small constant goes to 0. By our earlier characterization of noise sensitivity, all we need to show is that the, ma the spectral mass es escapes to infinity if it's not 0, and that gives us noise sensitivity. Very straightforward once you've seen KKL, right? So it's very, very similar. We just are looking at L2 bounds instead of L1 bounds. And since we have, if we have control of the L2 norm, we definitely have control of the spectral sample. So this is, once again, this random variable is in many ways the interesting random variable. And in fact, getting, we sort of get this log mn for free. For particular functions, in fact, a lot of the study of noise sensitivity of percolation is all about, okay, we get it for free that it's, between, that it's larger than log m. Can I push it further? If I know a particular function, how, what techniques do I have in terms of actually looking at the probability that it's between some polynomial power, for example, of mn? <coughs> Excuse me. So many of the works, there's sort of a very famous uh, paper by um, Christoph Garban, uh, Gabo Pete, and Odette Schramm about the noise sensitivity per properties of percolation. And basically, that entire paper, I don't want to say anything, at least my understanding of that entire favor, it's all about controlling this for mn being the correct power and you're actually getting concentration at the exact correct power of where we expect this to be concentrated. But if all we care about is noise sensitivity without any quantitative control, without saying how much noise do we have, because of course if, I looked, if, I, if you see that definition, I had epsilon fixed, send n to infinity, then send epsilon to infinity, right? I could just as easily make epsilon depend on n. And then it's a, if, if epsilon is now vanishing in n, if it's vanishing slowly, it'll probably be noise sensitive. If it's vanishing quickly, it might not be noise sensitive. And the question of exactly where that threshold comes is a very interesting question. Because it's saying, I'm not going to randomize every bit. I'm going to randomize a lower order number of bits. So instead of epsilon n, it's going to be, let's say, n to the 1 half, n to n over log n, whatever it is. And there, it's very, very interesting to see how noisy you need to make to actually get things to decouple. Very interesting property, but not for today. What we are going to do today, however, is finally get back to percolation after I've been lecturing for like, what, four hours about this kind of stuff that had nothing to do with statistical physics. Let's talk about statistical physics. In like 15 minutes, I need another theorem first. So for the remains of my half hour, maybe slightly longer, if I'll hopefully finish it, this is what I'd like to prove. 
that if we can consider the events of crossing the n plus 1 by n rectangle, so the square, essentially, the, the box, the events of having a horizontal crossing is a noise-sensitive sequence. So what that tells us is that knowing that you cross and then randomizing a few bits macroscopically, you know nothing. So really, percolation lives on a lower order set, if you will. Crossings are very, very thin things, and you don't really know what happened if you just sort of forget a few bits on average. Now, the way we do this is by another sort of very intuitive notion of what it means to be noise sensitive. And the idea is that you're noise sensitive if you don't care how many pluses you have, you care where the pluses are. So if in terms of percolation, I don't care. I know exactly that every subset is going to be, it's a Bernoulli random variable, right? Every subset is going to be, have half plus, half minus, and that should tell me nothing about whether I cross. It's really the fact that I need to look at these particular random subsets which are going to tell me whether I cross or not. So it turns out that this notion of correlation with majority functions is sufficient to get control of the L2 norm of the influences and therefore <coughs> this is also BKS by the way and therefore noise sensitivity. So I'm going to state the correlation with majority theorem. So I'm going to take a function f, a Boolean function f, multiplied by majority on k. Majority on k being exactly what you think it is. The, you, you fix this at k and you ask if there are more pluses than minuses and make it plus one, minus one otherwise, and just because k might be even, zero if there's a, a tie. And I'm going to look at over all possible subsets k and look at that correlation. Then the L2 norm is bounded by a constant times the square of lambda times the log. Let me be more careful here so that it's written up. Of n divided by lambda of f. And of course, these logs pop up everywhere, right? You really can't escape a lot of these logarithmic factors. And you'll hopefully see where this comes from when we actually prove it. Okay. Last lemma, and then I'm going to start going backwards. And let me just be safe. I want f. Uh, just to be safe, I think this might hold. I I'm not certain if it holds in generality. I think there's a few pathological cases where it doesn't hold. So I'm just going, just to make sure I'm accurate, Boolean and monotone. So consider f to be a Boolean monotone function on n variables. Then its influence is bounded by c times the square root of n times the correlation of f with the majority and square root of log of 1 over the correlation of that function with majority. So there's a few things to worry about here. First of all, f is Boolean, right? So it's plus or minus 1 and m is almost Boolean. If n is odd, then m is actually Boolean as well. There is no absolute values here, I'm sorry. But that's an important thing. How do we even know this is positive? We're taking logs of things and bounding influences. This seems problematic, right? But this is the nice thing. F is monotone. 
So if I take, consider I have two, two configuration, a configuration and then it's exact flip. By definition, by monotonicity, f is it going to be minus one on the smaller one and plus one on the, uh, on the larger one, or it'll be equal on both. If it's equal on both, then multiplying it with majority is just going to give you zero, because majority by definition is going to be one on the other and negative one on the other, on the, on one on the first and negative one on the other. The only way this gives you a non-zero value is if f is, changes as well, but f can only change in a positive way, right, because it's monotone. Because if, if m is negative and f is negative, it's impossible, it, it, sorry, if m is negative and f is positive, it's impossible to get m to be positive than f to be negative. So this is really strictly increasing if you only look at, uh, by looking at antipodal points on the Hamming cube. So at least that's safe. This is also very much rem uh, reminiscent of the theorem we proved last time, which is that the maximum influence for monotone function is given by majority. This is sort of a quantitative version of that, that if you're not majority, you do at least that badly. Because the c squared of n is exactly what we're going to get from the influence of majority. Right. Okay. It's monotone, so it's given by the, the sum of the first guys. which is exactly f times the sum of the x's, which is exactly f times the majority times the absolute value of the x's, because majority is just the sign of the x's, of the sum of the x's. Assume it's odd for now. It's not really important. If it's not odd, this also holds for uh, the case of even, because m would just give us a zero in the case that it balances out perfectly. Okay, let's partition. So I'm going to look over two possible sets. The sets at which this is smaller than square root of n, lambda square root of n, and larger than lambda square root of n. Central limit theorem, obviously, this is the, the right uh, scaling here, right? So, and this is complete equality. Actually, I'm going to make it an equality. If I now, let's look at this over this set. Whatever this is, it's bounded by lambda square root of n. So I get lambda square root of n. plus where I got rid of the f and m here on the right hand side, but both of those are at most one because they're Boolean functions. Okay. Now here, I can very easily just remove that, this constraint because although, again, this is not a positive function, if I look at antipodal points, I'm always going to only increase the function by considering pairs that are larger than lambda n. So if I just remove that, in, that, that indicator, I'm definitely increasing the function because I'm only taking pairs that either sum up to zero or plus one. Here, I'm going to just use the fact that I know the distribution of these guys, right? This is just like IID random variable, it's absolute value is larger than lambda n. This is basically going to be something like square root of n, the integral from lambda to infinity. And there should probably be an extra lambda in front. I'm cheating a bit, but you guys can see how to formalize this, I hope.
I'm putting the two in there just to be safe. <laughs> Right? Now, what we need to do is, of course, optimize. But the, optim the optimal choice seems pretty clear. Again, those logs popping up everywhere, because we want both of these terms to look basically the same. If I'm going to take C so that this is a power, so I get this to some power. And then I'm always going to get at least one lambda to kick my ass to make sure that I can't actually get this to be tight. Unfortunately, you always need some kind of logarithmic correction. And just like KKL, this is in fact going to be tight for, well, there exists function for which it's tight. I don't want to be too careful here. But you always need some kind of logarithmic correction because you always have these kind of phenomena where you try to optimize something, but you can always make things just a tiny bit larger by adding a logarithmic factor. I don't want to state this with too much certainty because there might be some pathological examples here. But we can get that inequality. OK. Let's start unraveling this string of theorems and prove that correlation with majority implies noise sensitivity. What I'm going to do is I'm, going to, I, I'm given a monotone function f. And I'm going to order my space in terms of decreasing influence. So that 1 has the largest influence, 2 has the second largest influence, etc. So specifically, now I'm going to apply my lemma to the first sequence of the first k of these influences. By lemma, <clears throat> and now what I'm going to get here is major is the influence, the correlation with the majority on that set K, but that's obviously bounded by lambda, right? Because lambda is the worst it can possibly be. So now I get a situation where I have a decreasing sequence with an increasing L1 bound. And what I want to do is I want to maximize the L2 norm. So how do I maximize These, are, of course, all should be depending on end, right? Because we have a sequence of Fn's. But for now, we can think of n fixed. So my claim is, although this is, an although this is an inequality, because this is a decreasing sequence, the L2 norm is maximized that this inequality is tight at every step. Intuitively, this makes perfect sense because of convexity. I've got a decreasing sequence. And sure, I can decrease this one in order to gain this one a bit. But because they're sort of ordered in the right way, I'm never going to gain anything because the amount I decrease is going to be punished by the amount of increase on the right. So intuitively, this makes sense, but I actually uh, spend a little time trying to come up with the proof they gave was a bit technical. I think I came up with a better proof. Tell me if there's any holes in this, but I think it's very clever. <laughs> so the setup is as follows. I've got xn, a decreasing sequence. And the summation from i equals 1 to k. So in fact, I'm just going to say sk is a summation of xk. And sk is smaller than some function g of k for every k. Equality. Huh? Yes. 
Thank you. So, I'm going to write this in terms of S's. And what I'm going to do is essentially summation by parts. So I'm going to separate these, sum them up, and just change the way this order this works. This is exactly, you can write this out explicitly if you'd like. This is going to be This is just summation by parts. If you want to think about it, just write this out, multiply it out, change the indices. Nothing particularly intelligent here. Now, this is bounded by GK, GK so I can bound this. And this is a positive number, so I can bound that. Right? Now I'm just going to completely flip the script and repeat summation of my parts the other way. G, I'm saying this is an arbitrary function. So I'm a, just, this is just a setup I have. I have a decreasing sequence. I define S as the, as the sum of the first K. And I assume I have some bound like this. This is completely arbitrary at this point. G is going to be this function in a second. Right? So, but this is going, this is a general property of real numbers that I'm proving right now. That if I want to sort of, given this, this property of I have an upper bound on the progressive sums, a decreasing sequence, and I'd like to maximize the, X, the L2 norm, then I'm just proving that I really want to make sure that every single step this inequality is tight. That is, the influences are given by this at k minus this at k minus 1. So I have the L2 norm squared being controlled by something like this. So it's a function that I know and an L2 norm and an xi. Cauchy Schwartz. Schwartz, I'm getting right? This guy squared, that's quite squared, and the square root. But these are the same things. So this is exactly the same. Now, when is Cauchy Schwartz tight? The proportional. So I get that every step is exactly equal to whatever function I have with an upper bound minus the previous one. Therefore, applying this to the sequence of influences, I deduce that if I want to maximize the influences, to maximize the L2 norm, excuse me, to maximize H of Fn, I want the ith influence to be equal to constant lambda of f square root of log of 1 over lambda of f times this at i. minus this at i minus 1, which by a standard sort of, maybe I need an extra constant here, I get a, this is order 1 over square root of i.
by now squaring all of these and adding up, I'm going to get these guys squared and an extra factor of log n. So all I need to show is that with any majority function, I have polynomially small correlation. OK, I promised I'm going to start drawing percolation pictures. Time to draw some percolation pictures. Let's get some chalk here. So I'm interested in now talking about, this is proof of EKS. I'd like to prove that, this, that the crossing function does not correlate with any majority. So by symmetry, you agree with me that if I can show that it doesn't correlate with any subset of the right half, that's fine. right? So I'm going to take this square, and I'm going to take a bunch of edges in the right half. So this edges. It's a set of edges. It doesn't necessarily need to be connected. I'm going to call this set capital K. And my claim is that the expectation of the indicator of having a crossing times the majority on K needs to be polynomially small in N. That's technically polynomial. The number of bits is n squared, but polynomial is polynomial is polynomial. So I'm just going to find an epsilon such that this holds. OK? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run an exploration process. I'm going to run an exploration process and look at the entire cluster of the left-hand side. That is, every edge on the left-hand side, I'm going to explore its open cluster and stop when I stop, when I just run out of time. OK, so what that means, I'm going to have some kind of thing like that, some kind of thing like that. Maybe it goes all the way around here. Maybe it enters k sometime. Maybe it does this. And of course, every time I explore, I don't just get edges. I also get dual edges. right? I'm, every time I question, I'm going to say, I walk on an edge and ask, are you open or are you closed? If it's closed, I step back. If it's open, I keep going and just make sure I do everything. So not only do I get this, I also get dual information. Everything, yes. <laughs> OK? Now, the great thing is if I tell you the yellow process, the function is Cn, indicator of Cn, is perfectly measurable with respect to the yellow edges E. I'm going to call them E. Right? If I made it to the right, I have a crossing. If I didn't make it to the right, there must be a dual crossing blocking me. So this yellow process is sufficient to determine this indicator. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to keep track of a few things. So I'm sorry. Um, could you repeat how you define the yellow exploration? It is this, the entire open cluster and dual closed cluster of the right hand of the left hand side. Excuse me. So anything that starts from here and makes it to the right. Awful fractal set. I don't know much about it. So. I'm considering the sequence omega 1 all the way up to omega m. The edges of the exploration process that are in k. Remember, k is a, sub, is a set of edges. So that every time, let's say I make it here, and I get an edge, the first one I enter is I'm going to call omega 1. Fix some canonical ordering. This really doesn't matter. So I'm going to just pick the thing. The first thing I'm going to say omega 1. And it's plus 1 if I get it, if it's open, and minus 1 if it's closed. 
And this is going to be the sequence of all edges of k that I've explored in my yellow process. Now notice that even conditional on that exploration, this is an IID sequence. Right? Every time I step on an edge, it's equally likely to be open or closed. So this is an IID Bernoulli one-half process. Okay? And it is all the edges in K. Okay, so my, our strategy right now is to start looking at events and ruling out some bad events. Okay, so I have two bad events I'm interested in. If I look at my set of explore edges and I intersect it with K, What's the probability that I'm going to get explore a large proportion of K? And by large, I mean anything like actually up anything of K, not just a microscopically small thing. So first thing, probability. Mm -hmm. So I take, I fix an edge in K and ask, what's the probability that I even explore it in the first place? Right, so I have an edge right here. And in order to explore it, I need to make it to it first, right? And to make it, that means I need to make some kind of dual path all the way, of open path, excuse me, all the way from my boundary to E. Now, this distance is at least N over 2. So by rousseau simon wells theory, we know that the probability of this event is small. How small? Polynomially small. By just considering annuli around it, and we have a probability of chance of blocking, constant chance of blocking in each annulus. So there exists some epsilon, in fact, I'm going to say three epsilon, because I know what I'm going for, such that the probability here is at most n to the minus three epsilon. This is just because of the one-arm exponent of critical percolation. We can do much better in general, but for now, all I want is 3 epsilon. Right? And you can get this by very basic rousseau simon welsh So by Markov, the probability of my bad event is at most n to the minus epsilon. Okay, so now when I look, I'm going to look at that correlation, and I'm going to split it up into bad event happens and bad event doesn't happen. So I just multiply the indicator and throw away everything else. So I now just managed to essentially, you can think of this as conditioning. I prefer not to because that changes the measure. But I'm now zeroing out any, any contribution in which this bad event happens, any exploration. And notice, this is a random event, right? I could have an exploration that actually covers all of K, right? But when I look at this right-hand side, any time that happens, this zeroes out. So I don't need to consider it. I now only have to consider the random explorations for which B1 doesn't happen. Because all that correlation is stuffed into here, and that's already n to the minus epsilon. That's good enough for us. Bad event two. I'm going to now look at a running tally of these omega, omega i's. The bad event two is that there is going to be a large deviation there. Because I know this is a sequence, this is a sequence of IID random variables. Their mean is zero. And by the central limit theorem, we know they're going to be well concentrated. So what I'm going to say, my bad event there is there exists a j such that the summation of omega i from i equals one to j in absolute value is larger, okay, I'll put the constant outside, 
fix a constant. So what is this? This is the maximal size of, my, of the number of edges I explored conditional on B1 complement. So if B1 complement fires, not conditional, excuse me, given that this event is one, this is the best, I, this is the worst I can expect. And I look, this running tally doesn't beat that. Right? So by the union bound, that a single J has this property. And the worst J is, of course, the last one. It has the largest variance. Now, this is essentially a normal random variable. And we need to be careful, because this is technically not a central limit theorem regime, because this is going to 0. But you can do these very standard, if you'd like. You can think of this as a barrier scene bound, although that's probably not a very good idea. Uh, if you want to do this by turnoff bounds, there is a lot of different ways to do this. Basically, as long as this is lower order than, the, than this size, excuse me, let me make sure I get it correctly. It's possible to extend the central limit regi uh, regime all the way to anything that's little o of this. And that's clearly here, right? For k large, at least. So this guy is going to turn out to be something is going to be bounded above. So there exists, for, given this constant here, I can come up with a power here, because if I put a logarithmic here, I make this polynomially small at least. In fact, super polynomial. I could put this, the log in the square root and still get a polynomial. Just being safe. The point is, for any k, because the largest k can be is at most polynomial in n. So this bad event doesn't happen either. And by the same kind of thing, we now have I now know that the first event does bad event doesn't happen, the second bad event doesn't happen. And we have CN. OK. Let's look, let's condition on the exploration. So I pulled out the CN because it's perfectly measurable. And I now have this guy to control given the exploration. So again, to make sure these don't happen, I need to make, look at only explorations that don't visit K too frequently and don't have large deviations along these sequence of omega i's. So what does majority on K look like given all this information? So I didn't actually explore much of K, right? So note that the number of edges I haven't explored is larger than k over 2, tautologically, whenever this fires. In fact, it's much better. I can get a 1 minus epsilon there, but I don't need anything more than k over 2. Right? And the excess of open edges in that is 
if I look at how many, I, I already know exactly what happens in these areas right here. But first of all, they're small. And second of all, I didn't pick up a lot of pluses anyway. I only picked up at most order square root of CK over N, right? So this expectation, no, I guess I don't have the CN in there anymore. So let's see. If I'd like the majority to give me plus 1, I can bound that above by the probability that the plus number of pluses, so I guess the sum of xi, i in k but not in e, is at, at least negative square root of 2 k n to the minus 2 epsilon log n with a constant in front. Right? Because if that happens, whatever excess I have, I'm going to get pushed up and I'll be fine. Minus same thing. Because if I'm below that threshold, I'm definitely safe. Right? Whatever excess things I can affect from E, I'm totally safe. But there's order k edges here, order k edges here, and this is order square root of k minus a lower order thing. So by standard, uh, by standard Gaussian uh, estimates, this is bounded by a constant n to the minus epsilon, because this is much, much smaller than the variance. The variance is order square root, uh, order square root of, of uh, size of k. And above and below, we sort of cancel out all the tails, and all you have is whatever happens in that small interval. That's the last term we had, right? n to the minus epsilon, n to the minus epsilon, n to the minus epsilon, an extra log, whatever. This is polynomially small, and that completes the proof, because we've now shown that we don't correlate with any of the majority functions. Therefore, the HFN, the L2 norm, is small, and by BKS, that's sufficient for noise sensitivity. I went very, very long, so I'm going to spare you guys my sort of concluding remarks. But uh, I'll give you a quick break and probably 10 minutes and we'll come back to do some exercises.